Hello, I'm Brian Young, and today we're going to be exploring 26.4.10, Motor Operation and Maintenance. Uh, so let's take a look at the NCCR book, Module 10 in Level 4. Motor reliability and lifespan, and as always, they start with trade terms. Uh, Insulation classes, categories of insulation based on the thermal endurance of the insulation system used in a motor. Megometer. We call this a mega. It's a megameter. It's an ohm meter for millions of ohms. An instrument or meter capable of measuring resistance in excess of 200 million ohms. It employs much higher test voltages than are used in ohm meters which measure up to 200 million ohms, commonly referred to as a mega. Soft footing. When the feet of a motor frame are uh, forced to anchor against an uneven surface resulting in distortion of the motor frame, this can cause misalignment of the bearings. Totally enclosed motor is a motor that is encased to prevent uh, the free exchange of air between the inside and outside of the case. Sometimes they call it hermetically sealed. Here on page one, right out of the gate, they're saying that the life expectancy of a squirrel cage induction motor depends largely on the condition of its insulation. So anything we can do in order to protect that insulation, uh, the longer life we can get out of that motor. That's what overloads are for. Uh, you have motors on a uh, motor controller, motor starter, and it has a set of overloads. Those overloads are supposed to open the circuit and stop the motor from operating if the current is above a predetermined value. Uh, if it's going to cause too much heat, that will cause the insulation to become brittle on the windings of the motor. Uh, it only takes a little bit of overcurrent to damage those windings. Bearing misalignment can be caused by a condition called soft foot when the feet of a motor frame are forced to anchor against an uneven surface. Uh, let's take a look at this real quick. So I'm gonna there. That's what the motor wants to be mounted on, and here is what it's really mounted on. There's a concrete, there's a dip in the concrete. It's an uneven floor surface. So you set your anchors in the concrete and then you start tightening down the bolts. Oops, wrong. What happened here? You're supposed to change color on me here. And you put the bolts into the anchors and what happens over here? Well, you start tightening, tightening, tightening. And the next thing you know, you've taken this frame and you've bent it down. Now you've put all kinds of torque on this motor. So here's your motor and uh, shaft running through the center of the motor. Uh, uh, why did you not change color? Why did you not change color? Ah, you. Anyway, there. The shaft running through the, the, the center of that motor is going to actually be pulled down out of alignment. So now it's not straight in the bearings anymore. It's being pulled down and it's rubbing on the bearings. 
that's going to cause all kinds of wear uh, on those bearings. So you'll take a motor that should have lasted 20 years and you'll be lucky to get six months out of it. The bearings will go bad. It'll start making all kinds of noise and vibration. And the next thing you know, you're gonna burn it up. On page two, uh, on the left-hand side, they're talking about polyphase or three-phase motors. Three-phase motors, you can start a three-phase motor with three phases. It'll run with, with two. You, you can lose a phase while it's running. You cannot start a three-phase motor with only two phases, but it, it'll run. The loss of a single phase of a polyphase power source can cause the failure of the remaining phase windings of the motor because they're gonna have a higher current on those two windings and the uh, overloads won't detect it. And over on page three, they're giving us some photos of actual damage of a motor that was running in single phase condition. A three phase motor that was running with just uh, two of the three phases, it was single phasing. So those windings have gotten burned up. Over on page four, they're showing us other uh, damaging. There's a lot of carbon buildup in this one. Uh, this one has a shorted uh, winding. So there are all different types of, of uh, problems you can have. On page five, on the left-hand side, uh, down almost to the very bottom of the page, second bullet up frequency. Fre frequency variations of not more than 5% of the nameplate frequency. So if it says 60 Hertz, you shouldn't be less than 57 Hertz. You shouldn't be more than 63 Hertz, 5% of nameplate frequency. And then uh, starting configurations, we have primary resistor or reactant starting. We have auto transformer starting. Auto transformer uh, starting uses an auto transformer to reduce the voltage and current on the first step. Y delta, this is clever. They start the motor in Y, it gets up to about 80% of run speed and it switches over to delta. Y delta starting impresses the voltage across the Y connection to reduce the current on the first step after a preset time interval. The motor is connected delta to permit uh, full load operation. Because if we have 480 volts and we hook it up Y, there's only 277 volts across each coil. When we swap over to delta, now we've got the full 480 volts across the coil. So the motor sees uh, 277, and then it sees 480. Insulation systems, uh, this is between the windings. The windings are varnished. It's a varnished wire. It's not a very thick insulation at all. Class A, Class A insulation systems have a suitable thermal endurance when operated at a limiting Class A temperature of 105 degrees Celsius. Typical materials used include cotton, paper, cellulose acetate films, enamel coating wire, uh, coated wire. So those are the different types of insulation they use on a Class A motor. Motor maintenance on page seven. Again, they have trade terms. You should stop at every section and read the, the trade terms. Insulation breakdown. I think that's a Led Zeppelin song. The failure of insulation to prevent the flow of current sometimes evidenced by arcing. The voltage is gradually raised. Breakdown will begin suddenly at a certain voltage level. Current flow is not directly proportional to voltage or breakdown current has flowed especially for a period of time. The next gradual application of voltage will often show breakdown beginning at a lower voltage than initially, and then leakage current. Here on the right-hand column of page seven, motor maintenance requirements, the frequency and thoroughness of maintenance and testing of a motor depend on such factors as the number of hours and days the motor operates, the importance of the motor, the nature of the service, the environmental conditions, these are all things that go into motor maintenance. How often are we going to do maintenance once every three months or once every week? Well, if it's a very dusty environment, if it's crushing rock, 
uh, if it's important because it's supplying water to a, a uh, municipality, these are things that are going to go into the maintenance schedule, uh, things that we're going to take into consideration for how often do we service that motor. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> these are different types of motors. The AO is air over, and they're cooled by air over. Uh, this is blower cooled, okay? TEBC motor is a blower cooled motor, a TEAO motor is finned air over motor that power, powers and is cooled by the slipstream of a large fan. So on the rotating shaft of the motor, they actually put a fan with fins that blows air over the motor and cools the motor as it operates. <clears throat> and this is a non-ventilated motor, TENB, non-ventilated. Uh, non-ventilated motors run at very hot temperatures. Do not touch these motors during Im or immediately after operation. They're hot enough they can burn you. Uh, on the bottom of page eight, it says tools and test equipment for electrical maintenance. You can use a tachometer. Check the rotating uh, speed of the, the motor. Make sure that it's within specs. You can use a stethoscope. It detects faulty rotating machinery bearings and leaky valves. Uh, if there's unusual bearing noise during rundown, like you run the motor and then you turn the motor off and it's running down, you can listen to it. And if the bearings have a lot of slip in them, a lot of play, you'll hear uh, you know a lot of uh, chatter, a lot of noise going on in there while the motor is actually slowing down. Uh, page 10, again, this is motor maintenance, uh, online motor analysis instruments. Uh, on the right-hand column of page 10, it says only the eye bolts on a motor frame are intended for lifting the motor. Do not lift it by the shaft. Some factory mounted accessories or covers also have eye bolts, but they must not be used to lift the motor. And don't ever use the uh, shaft of the motor. This is if the motor is going to be stored for a long time. Uh, some factory mounted accessories. Oh, the following is a list of recommendations for proper motor storage. If you're going to store that motor for a long period of time, rotate the motor shaft periodically as specified by the motor manufacturer so that they do not remain in the same position all the time. At least once a week, you should go into the warehouse and rotate the uh, armatures of those motors, especially if they're oil lubricated. It gets the oil into the bearings. It makes sure that they don't have any surface rust building up. Uh, make sure that they can break free. Frequency of lubrication. The frequency of motor lubrication depends not only on the type of bearings, but also on the motor application and its service environment. Again, what is it doing and where is it doing it? <clears throat> on page 13, on the uh, right-hand column, they're talking about end play. Motors should also be checked for end play, which is the backward and forward movement in the shaft. Ball bearing motors typically will have a 32nd to a 16th of an inch of end movement. In other words, if you grabbed the shaft of the motor, you could physically move it in and out. A 32nd to a 16th of an inch, it'll move. That end play is not a bad thing. Don't think of it as, as being harmful to the motor. It has a little bit of end play, and that's a good thing. Um, there's a whole art form to shimming these motors. We talked about soft foot. You don't just tighten it down to the floor. The floor is uneven. You put the motor in place. You level it. You make sure everything is exactly the way you want it, and then you start putting shims underneath here to build it up until it's tight on the shims. And then when you can tighten up all four of those bolts and the motor spins freely by hand, everything's good. And here's a motor and a driven load and they're, they're lining them up, making sure that uh, the shafts of both are in agreement, that um, they're collinear, they're on the same line. 
the center of this rotating shaft and the center of this rotating shaft, and they'll they'll put this uh, dynamometer on here and they'll make sure that the rotating machine has uh, a tolerance of just a few thousands of an inch. On page 17, on the right-hand column, absorption current consists of two components, polarization current and electron drift. Absorption current consists of two components, polarization current and electron drift. Basically, it says before making resistance tests, you must first understand the concept of absorption current. The insulation between two uh, connection points can be thought of as a dielectric, thus forming a capacitance. A phenomenon known as dielectric absorption occurs between the elect, uh, electric soaks, uh, whereby the elect, uh, I'm sorry, the dielectric soaks up electrons and then releases them when the potential is removed. This is an addition to the current that charges the capacitance and it occurs much more slowly. Uh, it, it is dependent on the nature of the dielectric, two items which uh, this is of concern are capacitors and wound equipment. Such current is referred to as absorption current or IA in figure 16. Absorption current consists of two components, polarization current and electron drift. Polarization current is due to the uh, reorientation of molecules in the insulation uh, impregnating the dielectric or the materials. It can take several minutes for this to occur and for the polarization equipment or current to drop to zero. The second component is current caused by the gradual drift of electrons through most organic materials. This drift current is minor and occurs until the electrons and ions become trapped by the mica surfaces commonly found in insulation systems. So electron drift, polarization current and electron drift. And uh, I've got nothing on page 2021, 20, page 22. On the left-hand column, determining the polarization index. Knowing the polarization index of motor can, uh, or generator can be useful in uh, appraising the fitness of the machine for service. It's commonly used for motors over 200 horsepower. The index is calculated from measurements uh, of the winding insulation resistance and is intended to evaluate the condition of the insulation. So it's the polarization index. Basically, you take the resistance after 10 minutes, you divide that by the resistance after a minute. Recommended minimum value of polarization index for AC and DC motors is two. You should have twice the resistance after 10 minutes as you do after one minute. So you would take those two readings and hopefully you've got twice the resistance. Grounded coils on page 23 on the right hand column. Grounded coils. A simple test to determine whether or not a ground exists in the windings can be made using a conventional con continuity tester. So just go from the windings to the frame of the motor and see if you get continuity. Uh, on page 25, they're talking about motor installations and co uh, commissioning guidelines. So on, on page 25, on the right-hand column, end play adjustment. To establish the electrical center of the motor shaft, loosen the bearings, if applicable, and operate the motor with no load. Mark the shaft position in relation to the end bell on the shaft. Shim, reposition, and tighten the bearings as necessary. After coupling the motor to the load, make sure to check that all the marked positions is maintained when the motor is operating. So you don't want it to be under distress. Uh, 3.2.1 first time startup. That's the only thing that I highlighted. I guess there's information on the next page that we need to know that this is initial startup. So <clears throat> when you start the motor for the first time, apply power and momentarily start it. That's called bumping the motor. Bump the motor to verify correct rotation. So you're not going to start the motor and let it run for 10 minutes. You're going to just bump it. Put a little bit of power to it, see which way it's rotating, and make sure that the rotation is correct. When it is, 
If so, run the motor for one hour with no load connected. This allows time for the bearings to seat. Uh, it's just a breaking in period. It's like when you buy a brand new car. I don't know how many of you have bought brand new cars. I've never bought a brand new car. Uh, they're always two years old. But basically, uh, you're supposed to not go over 60 miles an hour for the first 500 miles or something. I mean, there's a break in period. In fact, some people say don't go over 40 miles an hour. Well, you'd have to stay away from highways. Uh, you want to run that, that, that car's engine for a period of time to allow the bearings to seat, allow the piston rings to seat against the uh, cylinders, cylinder wall. All of these things have to kind of break in. And that's the same with an electric motor. Uh, you bump it for rotation, and if it's going in the right direction, run it for an, at least an hour with no load. And that'll, that'll be the break-in period. Well, this concludes uh, our video lecture on 26410 Motor Operation and Maintenance. If you have any questions, ask your instructor. Uh, and as always, work safe, work smart, and use your PPE. It's there to protect you. You are your greatest advocate for safety. Thank you.